Okay. Let's start. Good morning, afternoon, and evening. Hola, hello, bonjour, hola. Ni hao, konnichiwa, annyeonghaseyo, and hello all. Welcome and thank you, Simbis people, for joining us the 112th seminar, and I call it on MIT Day. I just got back home yesterday after my seminar trip to University of Mississippi. It was a good mix of work, meeting people, and sharing my you know, work, and also some fun tour, including my very short visit to the house of William Faulkner, a Nobel laureate in literature, Graceland and Sun Studio, where Elvis Presley, the king of rock and roll, lived and re recorded his first song, respectively, and Lorraine Motel and National Civil Rights Museum, where Martin Luther King Jr. was killed. I, was, I realized that scientific discovery, art and music, masterpiece and great spirit, spirit and minds live forever even after the person passed away. Especially in February, the month of Black history in the United States. Actually, that's another reason I you know, stopped by the uh, museum, the Human Rights Museum, even though I have very you know, hectic schedule during that seminar visit. I hope diversity, equity, and inclusion will be enhanced and live forever here and in the world, and the leaders will do things to achieve the goal rather than just saying things or pretend to do things to please the federal government. I made a longer remark today than usual because unfortunately, today's pioneer speaker, Hal Arper, cannot make it due to his reset scheduled flight at the last minute. I believe whoever will solve the flight delay and cancellation problems will receive a Nobel Peace Prize. I plan to try to impersonate Hal Arper to give a pioneer talk, but each individual has their own legacy and uniqueness. Thus, thus uh, I will replace his part of the talk by mentioning one episode about him. <clears throat> I met Carl Alper uh, for the first time when I was a graduate student at MIT, where he also received his PhD a few years earlier than myself. Interestingly, during one group meeting, my advisor, Chris Prather, invited him to our group meeting and print out his science paper to get his signature. Chris was an assistant professor while Har was a graduate student waiting for his defense at that time. I guess his work or whoever's work that is kind of a cheap, great discovery or some breakthrough, breakthrough work will live forever, as well as perhaps the hard copy Chris Taller print out with his signature. Okay, I will introduce the main speaker of today with a long introduction. Dr. Helen Ja received her bachelor's degree in 2007 from also MIT and her PhD degree in 2013 from Northwestern University in Material Science and Engineering. Generally, I call each in a seminar day a day based on the corresponding Pioneer Speakers Institute, but I said today is an MIT day Instead, because all three of us, including Hart Arthur and me, are MIT alums. 
after pursuing postdoctoral research at Eindhoven University of Technology and UC Berkeley, Helen studied as a tenure track assistant professor at Lancelot <coughs> Polytechnic Institute or IPI in the Department of Chemical and Biological Engineering in 2018. She has received a National Science in a Foundation Career Award, published many peer-reviewed journal articles, and filed multiple patterns to date. I also heard today she basically, you know, leading a big center as a co-director. Additionally, Helen currently sits on the Scientific Advisory Council of Materials Innovation Initiative, a nonprofit organization aiming to accelerate the development of next generation sustainable materials. Last year, I met her when I visited RPI for a seminar, and I was so impressed by her work, sharp insight into scientific problems, and also her intelligence. And I believe he, she is a true rising star in this field. Hopefully, she and I will collaborate on multiple biomaterials uh, project or sustainability or health related projects together. Helen, thank you so much for your time today and please take it away. It's all yours now. Thank you. Thanks, Jaisuk. Let me share my slides. Hopefully everyone can see the correct slides. Yes. There we go. Uh, it's my pleasure to be here today to give this talk, and thank you so much for taking the time to, to introduce me, Taesuk, and to the audience for being here. Your time is very precious, and we're in the middle of a, the semester, so everybody's very busy. Um, I think I changed the title of my talk from what was listed because I, I work on a lot of different things in the lab, but I, I want to give this talk a little bit more focus on maybe something the synthetic biology field would be uh, would resonate very strongly with. But in general, my lab here at RPI, well, we try to do a lot of things. One thing that we try to do is we try to study and understand naturally occurring materials um, from the molecular level all the way up into nano and micro into macroscopic properties um, and to see how they function. And so we are inspired by nature and we really wanna study naturally occurring materials. At the same time, we try to create synthetic systems that will allow us to create hopefully in a scalable manner um, medic materials um, that will be used in various application areas. Um, we are interested in everything from sustainable plastics to tissue engineering, tissue repair, to functional surfaces, for example, with biomedical functionality. Um, and I, I also have some projects in the space of biomanufacturing and drug delivery um, with collaborators. Actually, a lot of this work is with collaborators. So I, I try my best to uh, make sure I mention them on, on each slide where, where they their work is featured. Um, I, in the interest of time, won't talk about the functional material, the functional surfaces work or um, the tissue engineering repair work or the bio or the drug delivery work. We're, we're just going to focus on a very specific area of my lab, which I've had the pleasure of sort of growing into in my um, independent career. So what material? are we we're inspired by the most in the lab these days? Um, so for me, silk is an aspirational biopolymer. And most people will know silk from the silkworm, oh, you guys see here, from the silkworm cocoon. Um, and this is the fibers that are extracted and made into your silk clothing. Um, but actually a lot of organisms in nature make silk. Um, a good example is this weaver ant, which um, the ant doesn't make silk, but the, the larva state of the ant does make silk. And so what the ant will do is actually place that larva in its jaws, kind of tap it on the head. The larva starts extruding silk and the ant uses it like a hot glue gun, moving it back and forth um, to glue these large leaves together to form the fortress that the whole colony lives in. Um, and so you imagine this silk must be very strong and also quite adhesive. 
We then have, um, of course, spiders. Um, they make very complex web and actually they, they have multiple different types of silk that they are able to create and spin. Um, and we even have, you know, non, um, non web weaving spider. So this is a jumping spider here. It's not an orb weaver. It also oh, here makes silk, um, but uh, instead of using it to capture prey, it actually tethers it onto the surface that it's jumping from and uses it to sort of correct its flight trajectory in midair. So silk is a very diverse class of protein based polymeric material that has a lot of potential. And in particular, I'm interested in its potential as a potential uh, alternative to bio to, to fossil-based plastics. So uh, for one thing, silk is incredibly biocompatible. Um, it's already um, included in biomedical uh, devices like sutures because of it, how well tolerated it is in the body. It's also being explored as an edible food coating that would prevent food spoilage, for example, here from the company Mori. Um, it is naturally flame resistant. So that's uh, one advantage of having silk textiles over your polyester or you know, your fossil-based uh, fabrics. Um, and as, as far as properties go, silk is incredibly strong and tough. And so if, if you look at this graph here, this is uh, um, comparing, these, these are stress strain curves of various different types of silks made by um, either spiders, the ADM, uh, Abranius dianobansis spider, or there's two other spider species here, or a bombyx mori silkworm. Um, and it's compared to nylon or Kevlar. And what we see here is the the stiffness of a silk material is quite similar to nylon. So it's, it's not a very, very soft material. It's actually quite hard, um, but it has a lot more extensibility than, than nylon and it has more toughness than nylon or Kevlar. And so it can be a very, um, you know, suitable bioplastic material for um, applications where we currently use synthetic fossil-based plastics. So, um, and one advantage of silk is being a bio-made, bio-based material, it could be synthesized potentially uh, renewably. So one question that we have is, is, how do we get enough silk for actual commercial impact? And there are many industries that might be impacted, that, that could be impacted by, by such a, an endeavor, everything from tissue engineering to wearable electronics, biosensors, drug delivery, et cetera. Um, and there's this handful of companies that are in this space trying to create recombinant silk so not harvested from organisms, but recombinantly produced. Um, and this, this list that I've put down here is not all inclusive, but it's, it's also expected to grow. So this is a, a topic of rising interest in the last few decades. So we definitely need a way to access artificial silk, not, not naturally harvested silk. And of course you, you could naturally harvest silk. Um, this is how you might harvest um, silk from a spider. This is from the group of Fritz Volrath at Oxford. Um, they're one of the, uh, you know, top groups in terms of studying spider silks and silks in general. They've been at it for decades. And this is how they might reel a spider to collect some silk for studies. And of course, if you look at this, it is not something that can be scalable to commercial scales, though it is very useful as an analytical um, tool. But, you know, we, we could also farm um, silkworms for silk and this happens at commercial scale currently this is how we get you know our silk textiles and this is something that happens a lot in southeast asia where you have sort of these family distributed farms these giant racks uh, where they will toss silkworm larvae onto these racks and allow them to cocoon and then they will extract uh, or harvest the cocoons toss them in boiling water degum them and spin them on to um, spin their fibers so uh, this is um a bio-based process, right? It's, um, but it is actually very environmentally intensive. It does take a lot of mulberry leaves, which is the food source of the exclusive, these silkworms exclusively eat mulberry leaves. And so you have to grow a lot of mulberry leaves. And to do that, you need a lot of water and land. And so for a kilogram of raw silk, you need something like 5,000 or 5,500 cocoons. That's almost 200 kilograms of mulberry leaves or 50,000 liters of water. And you can only do this a certain number of times a year because you need to wait for the silkworm to reach the cocoon phase. And that equates to um, environmental impacts as well as uh, relatively high cost to this material. So we need some alternatives in terms of how to access um, silk you know, for commercial applications. Um, so to think about how we might do that, uh, I'm gonna to explain to you very briefly what silk is. 
Um, and thankfully, silk is, is both a very complicated material, but it's also quite simple from a molecular perspective. So in general, when you look at a silk fiber, there are, um, if you look at the cross section, there is a core that contains um, a class of proteins called fibroids, silk fibroids, or in the case of a spider silk, it would be called a spidroin. And this makes up the bulk of the fiber. There's some other glycoproteins and lipid coatings on top of that, but the spidroins or the fibroins are what control the majority of the properties of the fiber. And if you look at the, the sequence of these spidroins or fibroins, you'll see that they look a lot like a polymer. So they have a very large repetitive central core domain, which has these A, B blocks that repeat over and over again. The A blocks in this case would be hydrophobic and tend to form beta sheet nanocrystals. The B blocks are very amorphous and usually pretty hydrophilic, and they, um, uh, so they often high in glycine, proline, um, and, and glutamine content. Um, there are terminal, uh, N-terminal and C-terminal domains that are more or less helical. We'll talk a little bit about them later, but for the most part, this central core domain dictates the properties of the silk. Um, and so when the organism creates this protein, it is sort of disordered and unfolded. And during the spinning process, uh, a variety of things happen. pH drops, um, cosmotropic salts are introduced, there's the shearing and elongational flow. And this protein is able to assemble into this semi-crystalline material where you have these little nanocrystalline domains of the A block that hold the material together, give it the stiffness and the strength and the elasticity. And then you have the B block, which serves as an amorphous matrix that gives it its toughness, its energy dampening properties. Um, and so there is one class of man-made material that is actually quite similar um, in, in both chemical structure and, and sort of a nanoscale supermolecular structure. And that's this block copolymer called polyethylene block um, amides. So this thing called PBAC, P, PBAX. Um, it's a thermoplastic elastomer and you, sorry, it's not polyethylene, it's polyether block amide. Polyether block amide is a thermoplastic elastomer and you'll often find it in sort of these like foamy cushiony applications where you need a lot of energy dampening properties, but you need, also need some, some strength. However, if you look at the properties of natural silk and compare it to the PBAX that's available on the market, silk actually has a combination of strength and toughness that exceeds uh, pretty much any existing synthetic polymer that is available. So we definitely want to try to mimic silk as best as possible. And um, if we are able to do so in a way that allow us to control primary sequence of the silk protein, the spidroin or the fibroin, we can actually access a variety of different properties. And that's because the sequence has a lot of impact, even in nature, on the properties of, of these silk materials. And so I give a few examples here. Um, the Aedia tomata spider, the dragline spider, uh, the dragline silk has a spidroin that generally has sort of this amorphous crystalline, amorphous crystalline repeat motif. The crystalline motif is only six to nine uh, alanines uh, long. Um, and it's very, very uh, tough material, um, but it is you know, also very extensible. Whereas if you look at like a silkworm um, fiber, you see this fairly large crystalline block with a really short amorphous block. Um, but that crystalline block is, um, you know, it, it has a lot of glycines in it. And so it's not necessarily gonna crystallize in the same way as an local alanine. And so you get different properties for the silkworm fiber. And then if you look at something like a bagworm silk thread, um, bagworm silk fiber, it has a very complex um, motif structure in its, its fibroin sequence. And so just by playing with sequence, we can actually access different material properties. So uh, that's my pitch for why we should try to make um, artificial silk, but how are we gonna do it? Uh, in our lab, um, I have had the wonderful, um, you know, pleasure of collaborating with Professor Matthias Kofis, who is also in the chemical engineering department here at RPI. We have several co advised students together now. Alex Connor is the one who did the majority of the work in this presentation, and he has since graduated and is now working at McKinsey. Um, but our strategy towards producing uh, artificial silk is to use engineered bacteria. And so the idea is we're going to use engineered bacteria, which can be grown um, you know, at large commercial scales in fermenters, bioreactors, and engineer them to create various silk proteins. Um, and to 
this is in the, you know, in order to hopefully achieve this goal of having these high performance, durable and compostable protein based bioplastics, um, hopefully with our green uh, synthetic method that's scalable. Um, and hopefully use these materials to start to replace fossil based plastics that are currently used, you know, in a lot of industrial commercial applications. So um, why, why is this idea of biomanufacturing a polymer, you know, very attractive to me? And so we, we have seen a lot of instances where you can take use or microorganisms and ferment them and, and use fermentation essentially to create monomers for polymers like um, the lactic acid monomer, um, and then polymerize that using traditional, you know, polymer chemistry methods to create a polymer. So what I'm talking about here is something a little bit different. It is the direct creation of uh, a polymer or polymer-like material using a microorganism. And there's a lot of advantages to doing this, and I'm also going to cover the disadvantages. But some of the advantages would be that we can use aqueous solvents even to create the polymer, right? Not just to make the monomer, but to make the polymer, we use aqueous solvents instead of organic solvents, um, or we don't use high temperature also. Um, we can use diverse heterogeneous feedstocks as opposed to in the case of polymer synthesis. Many of you may know if you've tried it, you need really pure monomers and reagents to do so. Um, in the case of a microbial system, you have quite a lot of play in sort of what you can use as a feedstock that you put into the system. The waste products of this kind of process are often less toxic, and we have precise control over the chemical structure of the synthesized macromolecules, which is something the polymer chemistry field has a lot of struggle with. Our synthesized materials are biodegradable naturally. They're made by you know, bio, my, microorganisms and they are able to be degraded by microorganisms. And um, we can potentially also use this as a strategy for providing uh, high value end of life options for non-compostable plastics or other waste streams. I'm gonna call this upcycling optimistically. So um, this is my pitch for why we should try to make plastics in engineered microorganisms. And at this point, if I'm talking to someone who is not in the biomanufacturing bioprocessing field, they'll often say, are you talking about some strange Star Trek you know, sci-fi future, because that sounds really, really sci-fi. And I will then point out to them that we actually, as a society, have been using engineered uh, or organisms to make high, you know, products um, for us for thousands of years. So right, earliest examples would be beer and wine and cheese. These are all um, industries that rely on living organisms to produce the product. And more recently, we have bioethanol, which is a $34 billion industry in 2020 and increasing. Of course, we have vaccine manufacturing, um, which uses very difficult to culture and control. You know, not they're not bacteria. They oftentimes mammalian cells is much harder to work with. And we do all of this at large commercial scale. So uh, to me, the idea of using microbes to make plastic is not some strange sci-fi future. I think it is a very natural extension off of, you know, like existing industry that already has seen a lot of um, infrastructural development and technology development. So I'm very optimistic about this idea. Okay, so how would we make recombinant silk uh, in organisms? Uh, this is not a, a new um, thing. You know, people have been looking into this for several decades now, and they have tried recombinant hosts, everything from uh, salmonella to mammalian cells to plant cells. Um, they've even engineered, um, you know, uh, Go, a goats to express recombinant silk into the milk and then you just have to milk the goat and you have to extract the silk protein out of that. Um, but and there's also been transgenic, you know, silkworms that can make some amount of spider silk. So there's been a lot of study into this and alongside that there's been studies of how to control the properties of the proteins that are made this way, for example, by artificial spinning or various other processing methods. But one problem that has, you know, really plagued much of the work in this field is the very, very low titers that come from recombinant expression of silk. Um, and so the yields per, per liter of culture are just very low. And so, especially for a, a material. So there may be some upstream challenges here, um, like translational bottlenecks or, or maybe something else. So my group, and there are other, other groups also looking into this issue, um, 
so my group in collaboration with the Mateus Kofis' group have been investigating a lot of things in this area. And so one thing that we look at is we look at the effect of protein sequence on expression. We've also been engineering new host cell strains with enhanced capacity for silk food borne expression. And we've been trying to understand the mechanisms that underlie low titer. And so here's an example of one recombinant silk protein that we um, have been making in the lab. It has a this sort of AB repeating motif. The A block is an oligoalanine and the B block is this glycine proline rich sequence. Um, and we can make the A block longer and the B block shorter. And we can make that repeat any number of times, like four times or 16 times. A former would be a 16 kilodalton protein. A 16 murder would be about a 50 kilodalton protein. And so we also, um, by the way, this picture here, that's a picture of the freeze dried. Uh, protein produced in E. coli. looks very fluffy after you freeze dry it. Um, and so what we initially did was we screened a lot of um, E. coli hosts, some that are very, you know, uh, common in commercial um, platforms like BL21, this sort of a workhorse strain for at least lab recombinant production um, of proteins. Um, and we also looked at other strains like BL21 P. lice S, which has a uh, helper plasmid that inhibits basal expression of the T7 promoter. Uh, we looked at things like SolubL21, which has been um, sort of developed through directed evolution to make proteins in cases where the parent strain is not able to make the protein. Um, and we also created a hybrid strain. So here we see that, um, you know, titers, soluble titer on the X, on the Y axis, uh, for many strains are very low. For BL21, that workhorse strain, we're down at, you know, just a few milligrams, about 10 milligrams per liter of culture. And both for, um, you know, something that has low alanine content and high alanine content, it's fairly similar results. We see that there are two strains, P lice S and SolubL21, that for both the small protein and the large version of the protein, um, they performed much better than the other strains. And so what we did was we hybridized the two strains. We created a SolubL21 chassis with the P lice S vector. And we found that that had um, up to 33 times higher titers than you know, your conventional BL21 strain. We also found that plasmid maintenance was uh, nearly 100% with this hybrid strain, whereas other strains had zero to 70% plasmid maintenance, which got even worse as that protein got longer, um, meaning that it was you know, a substantial burden um, on, on the host cell. But our um, hybrid strain was able to do much better. At this point, we actually saw something very interesting or very disturbing, uh, which is that when we ask our uh, hybrid strain to, cre to, to create or express silk, so we induce it to express silk, what we can see is that the um, cell biomass or the cell growth is severely uh, reduced over time, whereas uninduced strains or empty vector strains or even something that is a strain that's induced to create an elastin-like polypeptide, which has a lot of similarities to silk, um, they don't see that same um, uh, impact on biomass growth. Um, and we thought this was very interesting because the ELP and the this protein, the silk protein that we're making are very similar. They're both about the same size. They're both highly repetitive in sequence. They both have a large um, glycine, proline, and alanine content that's almost identical. Um, and the difference is we have a lot of glutamines in our silk and the ELP has a lot of valines and tyrosines or more valines and tyrosines, I should say. And so why might the ELP be not burdening the cell, not causing this toxicity in, in the silk, be causing it? And we hypothesize that this has to do with the uh, impact of an intrinsically disordered protein product on the host cell. And so what you can see here is some amino acids are order promoting like tyrosines and valines, which the ELP has, and glutamines and um, this glutamic acid are disorder promoting, generally speaking, and that's what our silk protein has. And we know that our protein has a fairly disordered structure because we see it in the form of aberrant SDS page mobility. We see it by FTIR, FTIR analysis, and we also see it through our computational analysis. So we are thinking that this silk protein is somehow toxic for uh, microbial or bacterial hosts. And um, that's leading obviously to low titers. Uh, so why does our SolubL21 hybrid strain perform better? Um, its parent strains, the P lysis, has a restriction on basal expression by having this T7 lysozyme. 
And the solubile 21 was actually engineered to have altered stress response pathways by genetic mutations. We um, you purchased solubile 21, but we had this genome sequenced. And what we did find is that there are mutations on 14 genes that are involved in stress response pathways. For example, this NVZ mutation gives constant upregulation of acid and enzymatic stress responses. And so it seems like this strain was uh, you know, directed evolution, made it just really good at responding to various types of stresses that the cell might be under. And that suggests to us that the silk product is actually stressing the cells somehow. So to kind of test this hypothesis about the effect of disorder, we synthesized a silk that has um, its term that has terminal domains. So N and C terminal domains. In natural silk fibroin or spidroins, this N and C terminal domains are not disordered. They're actually helical usually. Um, and they help with the, the assembly and folding, or not folding, the assembly process during spinning of these proteins. So we added the Black Widow Western Black Widow um, NNC termini to our sequence that we studied before. And what we saw here is, first of all, a decrease in structural disorder, as can be told by FTIR and some computational analysis, but also a substantial increase in cell growth during expression just by adding these terminal domains. And we were able to achieve titers at something like 100 milligrams per liter in a shake flask culture, which is much higher than what we had before. So we want to examine this toxicity in more detail. Um, so you have product toxicity, which is literally saying the, the presence of the product in the cell can cause some problems. Or we have metabolic toxicity, which means there's a burden in creating or expressing this protein, which is somehow affecting the cell's ability and its cell viability, uh, its ability to grow and its viability. So both factors can contribute to of course cell growth and product expression. And it was very difficult for us to try to tease out what was at play here. Uh, so we turned to a collaboration with the group of Yingji Tang at Washington University in St. Louis to do metabolic flux analysis. And uh, I'm not an expert in this, so I will go over really quickly. Uh, we use a C13 label glucose um, and mass spectrometry methods to quantify various uh, intermediate metabolites. There is some genome scale modeling that also gets used uh, to sort of put the results in context. Um, these models integrate, you know, uh, the experimental metabolic flux analysis data with some baseline information about genes, enzymes, and pathways, and they will, they should hopefully allow us to predict um, metabolic responses to, to these circuits and sort of understand what's happening. So at the end of the day, we hope to have some clues about how to alter the media or perhaps the sequence of our proteins for better out outcomes. And what this study found was a lot of interesting things. So first of all, it was found that when we did this analysis using M9 minimal media plus a glucose supplement, we had much lower titers. You know, titers went down to some 30 um, milligrams per, per liter. Um, and for the A5 former, so that's a pretty small, low alanine content silk uh, spider uh, spidroin. We had almost 40 milligrams per liter for the elastin-like polypeptide. It was almost 30 grams per mix per liter. And for the longer version of the silk protein, we're down to six mix per liter. Um, so that wasn't surprising because, you know, we're in a not as nutrient rich media as, as LB with glucose. But what was also surprising is that we found that there was um, a, in, there was it seemed like there were stresses, metabolic stresses that were causing a, a greater demand for ATP. And um, possibly uh, we, we thought that, you know, when cells are under pressure, their oxidative phosphorylation at the outer membrane is less efficient for ATP generation. And so we uh, found that there's an acetate overflow potentially as a, a way for the cell um, to meet this ATP demand. Um, the acetate overflow can be seen here. It is seen in all, you know, in, in all strains that are producing either recombinant silk or recombinant ELP. Um, what we also saw was this upregulated gly uh, glyoxylate shunt. And a lot of that resulted in a reduced TCA cycle flux, which is likely caused by this acetate overflow. And as a result, sort of reduced cytosolic acetyl-CoA um, and re reduced sort of the availability of amino acid precursors as well. So it seems like there are some oxidative or acid stresses at play um, that uh, are in a lot of ways related to high ATP requirements of protein expression. 
So there's something else that we found in cofactor analysis. So you can see right here, there, it, when the cells are making either the spidroin or the ELP, we have um, a decreased amount of ATP and NADPH available. Um, this also is due to, well, it's related to the high proline and glutamine content in particular in our silk protein. Um, you know, it, we, glucose goes into the TCA cycle and the, you know, out comes glutamate and you need a lot and that that's being used to make proline and glutamine. And that is in high demand in our system. And this enzyme right here will consume NADPH. And so as a result, because of the particular richness in proline and glutamine of our sequence, we, we require a lot more NADPH and a lot more ATP, um, which is again, what is leading to the depletion of these in our um, common organisms that are expressing these things. Um, so our unusual amino acid requirements sort of contribute to these cofactor depletions. And we see similar effects on both silk and ELP, but it is a little bit higher for silk as would it be expected from our additional glutamine content. And um, all of this is causing you know, problems like acetate overflow, TCA flux decrease. Uh, we also see an upregulation of the ED pathway. We think this is sort of a cell um, attempt to respond to um, the stresses that it's under. Um, it produces, the, the ED pathway is uncommon. It produces less ATP than the EMP pathway, but it does require fewer enzymatic steps. Um, and so it may be providing a shorter route for amino acid precursor supply. So it, it's also literature has suggested that ED pathway is associated with oxidative stress response. So we see that for both ELP producing strains and silk producing strains. Um, so clearly, both for making ELP and ATP, there is some sort of issue with ATP supply in both systems. However, there is what appears to be some sort of exaggerated oxidative or acid stress in the silk producing strains. Um, interestingly, we also attempted to supplement our media with some amino acids. We looked to supplement the media with um, the amino acids that are um, made by the cells. So not, you know, taken up from the media naturally. Uh, sorry, no, sorry, I don't mean naturally. So they are made by the cell if the cells are expressing our recombinant protein, um, as opposed to um, being taken up from the media. So we try supplementing with these seven amino acids, which we've noted to have low C13 label, like fraction, uh, fraction labeling, um, which means that the cell is, you know, trying to make them as opposed to taking the majority of them up from the media, meaning they are probably depleting them in the media. So we supplemented with these seven amino acids. Um, we also tried supplementing with an additional amino acid um, to see uh, this one is tied to NADPH bottleneck. So we, we tried to see if that will help. And in all cases, we saw a dramatic increase in titers when we supplemented with these amino acids, except for um, the, the very long silk protein. And this is particularly interesting because these amino acids don't actually occur in the sequence of our silk protein. They are completely separate from our recombinant protein product. And so this really points to some central metabolic um, disturbances due to the expression of our product. One thing that we also saw is, so, so what we've seen so far is that silk causes ED pathway upregulation, which seems to point to some sort of stress. There's ATP and NADPH depletion. Um, the larger protein has comparable acetate overflow to the other strains, but at, it has much lower titer. So to length of the protein is also a, a factor. Um, we see decreased cell growth um, when cells are producing silk and LB media. Uh, we don't see that for the elastin-like polypeptide, even though both proteins, silk or ELP, seem to cause you know, these ATP and NADPH depletions. What we also saw is, and here's a huge difference between ELP and silk, again, very similar amino acid compositions, just differ in disorder, is that when we added glucose, more glucose to the media, we actually saw that it decreased the titer of silk production, whereas it increases the titer of ELP production. So the two proteins, which again are very similar, except for some amino acids that will contribute to order or disorder, um, seem to have similar metabolic bottlenecks, but silk seems to somehow sensitize the, the cell to the usage of glucose. Um, and so we think this is a product related toxicity that's unique to the silk construct. It seems like um, there, 
acetate that, that the silk is sensitizing the cells to acetate overflow more so than another recombinant protein would. And what we did here is essentially add acetate into the media. And for the elastin-like polypeptide, adding acetate does not seem to affect titers, whereas adding acetate um, substantially starts to decrease titers for silk producing strains. And this effect is even worse for the longer silk proteins. So we generally think that there is some um, product toxicity feedback loop generated by a recombinant silk product um, where the metabolic burdens reduce ATP and NADPH availability. It causes acetate overflow and lowers the TCA cycle flux. Um, it seems like that will cause, you know, more reliance on glucose metabolism, but then we have this uh, more assay overflow issues. Um, and that particularly hurts the spidroin producing cells. Uh, we can supplement with amino acids to increase titers, but it doesn't completely resolve this um, feedback loop that's caused by the toxicity of the product itself. So I've described some challenges facing silk production. Um, there's upstream challenges, including um, plasmid or gene instability, some transcriptional challenges, which I'm not, um, you know, there's translational challenges, metabolic burdens, and now we've kind of discussed this product toxicity issue. This is all very much dependent on feedstock. Uh, so what media uh, composition the cells are in, as well as the sequence of the protein we're trying to make. And so, Ideally, you know, the production, uh, effective and efficient production of a protein-based biopolymer in a, a recombinant organism needs to consider all of that at the same time, right? What sequence are you trying to make? What end properties will that sequence have for a commercial application? And how are you going to um, deal with the possible metabolic and product toxicities that come from that particular sequence, um, perhaps by adjusting various aspects of your media composition, maybe not using glucose, um, maybe supplementing with amino acids. So there's a whole, I think, a lot of work to be done here, and it requires a, quite a multidisciplinary view on the problem. Um, I'm going to take, I know I'm running a little bit low on time, so I'm just going to take a brief, maybe five to seven minutes to talk about another project that we have going on in the lab. And this project is the idea of using engineered microbes to convert waste plastic into high value products. And so right now, our plastic economy looks like this. So right now we have a lot of plastics that's being made in the world. 98% um, of that is made using virgin feedstock, often fossil based, uh, you know, stuff extracted out of the ground as in the form of crude oil and then um, taken from various distillation fractions of crude oil. Um, we have 78 million tons of plastics, and this is, uh, I think our report is already several years old, so it's even higher than that now of annual production. Very little of that actually gets recycled. Um, about 2% goes into closed loop recycling. Everything else goes into cascaded recycling or product process losses, but the majority of this stuff just gets landfilled or burned or they escape into the environment. Um, a lot of it is not biodegradable. And so when they get into the environment, they will stay around for um, hundreds to a thousand years. Um, something along those timelines. So we were thinking, can we use microorganisms to combat this problem while also providing a, a, a scalable green method of creating new materials that are sustainable? So this idea would involve us creating a recombinant bio-based polymer, um, but also having that organism be able to use waste uh, products from the plastic industry to do so. So we looked to um, Pseudomonas bacteria. So this is a really, really interesting genus and there's a lot of species that characterize. Many of them have, sorry, have unique metabolic capabilities. Um, they can consume a wide range of non-traditional carbon and nitrogen food sources. They do like glucose quite a lot like most bacteria, but they're also able to um, survive and even thrive on things like polyethylene, um, even BPA and certain, you know, oil fractions. Um, studies have shown that they can actually create um, this polyester called PHA, um, even while metabolizing something like a hydrocarbon instead of a, a sugar. Um, and so our, our task here is to engineer a pseudomonas chassis to create a recombinant product while using some of these non-traditional carbon sources that come from um, waste plastic. So we started looking at um, how do we culture pseudomonas and grow it in um, a media that only contains a hydrocarbon, such as one that might be derived from waste plastic. So we looked at 
um, using C16, which is hexadecane, as a proxy for what you get out of pyrolyzing polyethylene. And we tested a variety of conditions, which basically trying to optimize the media composition here. We tested several um, you know, nit different nitrogen sources, ammonium chloride, ammonium nitrate, and uh, C16, by the way, is um, the, one of the most prevalent um, compounds you'll find coming out of pyrolyzed polyethylene. So we use that as a you know, proxy system for our studies to begin with. And what we did find is these are CFUs uh, in various culture conditions. We did find that both that Pseudomonas aeruginosa in particular was able to grow quite well on just using hexadecane as a carbon source in the media. Um, and it was, there are certain media formulations that do better and certain that they don't do as well in, but in general, we get pretty good cell growth um, at something like, you know, point, close to 0.5% C16 in the media. Um, we also found that there was rather poor growth when we used an antibiotic uh, in the media for, you know, selection purposes. Um, and there was extremely poor plasma maintenance. Uh, we found that altering culture conditions or changing plasmids didn't help with this problem. And, and we found this problem is even worse for the other strain of Pseudomonas that we looked at. And so all of that pointed to us that um, we could not use plasmids as a, a way of engineering this organism to produce our silk. Uh, we needed to go with genomic integration. So after we did that, and by the way, for those who are not familiar, genomic integration means we actually integrate the silk producing gene into the bacterial chromosomal DNA, and we wouldn't need uh, antibiotic uh, for selection purposes. Um, so we did integrate uh, first a green fluorescent protein just as a test uh, into the genome of uh, Pseudomonas aeruginosa. Um, couldn't do that with Pseudomonas aeruginosa, it didn't quite work. Um, but what we did find was the ability for this strain to produce green fluorescent protein while using hexadecane as the sole carbon source. Um, we also were able to create silk. So in the same strategy, we integrated into the genome the um, gene for creating our A5 former spidroin. And using hexadecane as a sole carbon source, our, our pseudomonas uh, strain was able to create about 10 mg per liter um, of this silk protein, which you can see right here. Um, and it can do so with about half a percent of C16 and a little bit of a nitrogen supplement. Um, at this point, we're turned to collaborators at Argonne National Lab. They provided us um, a sample of their depolymerized polyethylene. So this is depolymerized using a platinum catalyst into a hydrocarbon, um, which is um, about 305 grams per mole in size and has a non-negligible degree of branching. So this is a waxy material. We fed that to our cells in culture. And what we were able to see is, first of all, we did get good cell growth. And the, the manner that we give it to our cells matters. So whether you create like um, a bolus, like a piece of it in the flask, or you spread it out as a disc, and then you rough it up a bit, seemed to make a difference. And so at the end, what we got was like a disc of this waxy material, which is not soluble in water, by the way. It's one of the challenges. And um, it just kind of floats around and sort of you know, it'll break up a bit in the, the, the shake flask as we're culturing. And um, of course, there's room for improvement even on this front. But what we were able to see is, first of all, growth of cells in this um, flask using just this wax that's from depolymerized polyethylene as a carbon source. And we were able to produce recombinant silk at a titer of about 11 uh, milligrams per liter of culture, which doesn't sound like a lot, but actually that's about the same that BL21 E. coli, the workhorse strain used for bio, you know, lab uh, recombinant production um, experiments, that's about how much that produced. So this is, I think, a really good starting point. There's a lot of promise here for us to optimize. And so um, I want to wrap this up by kind of presenting my perspective on this, this challenge of creating using microorganisms, engineered organisms, to create our plastics. Um, so here we need work, uh, you know, uh, upstream and downstream. So everything from optimizing the feedback, uh, the feedstock that we give the cells. So are we going to um, depolymerize the plastic a little bit or pyrolyze it before we feed it to the organisms? Do we need to pre-treat it somehow? What about the dyes and other additives that are in these um, waste plastics? No work on that aspect. Um, there's a lot of room for synthetic biology and metabolic engineering, um, optimizing strains, optimizing maybe genomic integration methods, or even thinking about how can we get plasmids to work if we wanted to go that route. 
Um, there's the upstream processing challenge, so optimizing and scaling up uh, culturing. Um, the downstream processing challenge, how do we isolate and purify these you know, polymers like silk um, in the most cost-effective way possible? And, and once you get that, how do we process them into you know, your uh, food wrap or your plastic bag or you know, whatever it is you want to make? So I hope I'm convinced you somehow that biomanufacturing and biotech can hopefully play a critical role in the sustainable plastics economy. And we can use engineered microbes to create high value monomers and polymers from diverse feedstocks, which can even be waste streams from other industries. Um, the metabolic engineering, particularly for materials design needs to be complemented by tools that aid rational materials design because sequence affects both material properties and the ability of the cell to express them. And there's of course a lot of challenges like scale up, low titers, cost of this manufacturing infrastructure, supply chain for you know, the, the waste feedstocks that we wanna feed the organisms. So I think this is a really inspirational task for me but there's a long way to go. And I would like to wrap up by of course, thanking my research group um, and uh, our funding. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you so much. I mean, this is an amazing talk. You know what? I I came back and then I went to bed. I after four four hours sleep, I wake up again three thirty in the morning. That you wake me up basically. <laughs> so uh before waiting for uh some question, I want to have multiple questions. I hope you could answer. Uh, my first question is your first part of the, your talk. That's very fascinating to me. Uh, I'm very interested in biomaterial, but I never done any bio. I actually I done my biomaterial research when I was in the company, biopolymer generation using bacteria, etc. But in my group, I haven't done much. W one thing you know, I kind of curious is there are probably two different approach to make your bacteria produce lots of protein silk. One would be combinatorial random, you know, design of the sequence of protein and then screen all of that, this, you know, you know, very large scale screening, I guess, and then characterize the property later on, whatever high producing protein sequence. The other way might be using so-called AI protein structure design algorithm, and then somehow select some based on, I don't know, sequence structure, whatever relationship, mm -hmm. you know, correlation. There are two ways. I just wanted to hear about this both sure. approach and then perspective. And my second question about that one is, even if we do so, let's say one bacterium produce a lot of specific sequence uh, silk, that's not necessarily good for the specific property we wanted to see. And then I want to also hear about yeah. your comment on that challenge. Absolutely. This is one of the biggest challenges, I think, of the, the whole concept of making a recombinant protein polymer in you know organism. We have a very large sequence space yes. that we can potentially access, but we don't know what sequence gives what material properties. Yes. And one of the big challenges is when you talk about a material, you need a fairly large amount of material to actually be able to test any properties meaningfully. Right. So, you know, when it comes to things like tensile, like mechanical property testing, we milligrams of material is not enough. You need uh -huh. grams of material. And to do that in a high throughput way, uh, synthesis is, is I, I think a, it would be a dream, but mm -hmm. I, I'm not optimistic about that. Yeah. So. One thing that my lab does do that we I have not had a chance to talk about is we have been trying to predict, uh, create computational simulations that can help us predict end mechanical properties of a recombinant spidroin based on its sequence, which again, we can control at the genetic level. Um, and this computation is really trying to mimic a lot of things. How does that molecule self-assemble and how will it respond under tensile stress? Um, so that hopefully that kind of thing can help guide us in designing a sequence that will be suitable for a target application. And here's the, the other difficult part. 
if you want something for cosmetics, that's going to require different properties of the material than something, you know, if you want to put it in a shoe or a textile. So you, you have to consider like what the end application sector is as well. But at least we hope to have some sort of computational way to reduce down the, the sequence space that we have to look into to get wow. the properties that we want out of the material. But this is a, a, a fairly large challenge. Um, the, the other thing is, is that the sequence, as I mentioned, also affects the ability of the cell to create it. And it could be quite substantial, the effect of sequence. And so to me, you have to think about this as a code development process. You should really have an end application in mind, which means you maybe should be talking to the end user, understand uh -huh. the properties they want, and then be sort of work in developing or engineering both the protein sequence as well as the 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 you know the engineered platform that you're using that the microbial host the upstream um, processing and all of that at the same time it has to be co-developed it can't just be uh, I'm independently working on these things and I hope to smash it together and get some sort of you know cost effective way to get an end product that somebody wants so it is I think one of the biggest challenges of this this particular type of work um, and uh, needs a lot of people, you know, kind of coming together, convergent research, as NSF might call it, to, wow. to consider all these problems, you know, as, as we're working on one thing, everything else has to be thought of at the same time. There yeah. are some interesting computational tools for like AlphaFold, for example, uh, mm -hmm. for predicting the structures of well-folded proteins, like enzymes and other globular proteins. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, they're not effective for something like silk, which is highly repetitive and can take on a variety of different structures that mm -hmm. are all energetically somewhat similar, and it's so mm -hmm. dependent on processing. So, for example, I think if you put silk in something like AlphaFold, you put the sequence in, it'll say this is going to form a lot of beta sheets. Mm -hmm. But silk doesn't form beta sheets um, unless it's in certain conditions or it's undergoing certain processing. So, um, and it, so AlphaFold is, to be honest, of limited. I mean, that it's use usefulness to us because our protein is very different from the, the training um, set that that AI algorithms like AlphaFold have been uh, trained on. That is what I also heard. Alpha Fold also has lots of limitations, especially some specific category of protein. And also, we don't have much data set for uh, the, those kind of silk protein. Yeah. And because that is also, you know, huge data set based kind of algorithm at the end of the day. So, you know, pot potentially, I mean, you generate a lot of data later on. Alpha Fold improve based on mm -hmm. your data. But that's, yeah. you know, all right, yes. And silk is also very processing dependent, just like most polymers, actually. The properties are very dependent on processing. And so that um, is an additional challenge sort of in this rational design space. Got it. I, one thing, you know, I don't know, potentially, now I understand, you know, even milligram is not enough to characterize lots of mechanical property. Uh, is it possible to think about generating, you know, still, you know, library of whatever silk protein, a lot of the, a lot, many number of, you know, protein, and then potentially have the library. And then somehow accidentally that has some good property, like, for example, you know, positive, you know, created, just somebody just generate some whatever you know material but later on we didn't expect that type of property mm -hmm. will be useful for later on so we yeah. generate a bunch of different things and then later on oh this might be good property for specific applications yeah yeah i think the, the we can um think about generating large recombinant libraries and and just screening or or characterizing biomass you know you know cell growth rate and also titers and then just say there okay so here are the sequences that are most easily produced by this particular strain mm -hmm. or these strains that we're looking at and then synthesize a few of those at larger scales test their properties and then basically go out and say hey does anybody want this Mm -hmm. Is this useful to you? Are these part like that? That is a, a method that a potential method. Um, yeah. Silk genes are a bit difficult to work with. Um, yeah. They're really repetitive. They're quite high GC content, yeah. and so I think even the creating the recombinant library is a bit of a challenge. But I, I, I yeah. can, I think, I think it can, it can work. Yeah, yeah. Actually, I know very well because my colleague, uh, my my lab mate, uh, when I was postdoc, uh, he actually found a company, the Bolt Thread. 
Yeah. You know, he complaining all the time. It's so, so difficult problem to solve at the time. Even even uh yeah, many years ago. Wonderful. Uh I have actually I, I understand also know very well about your burden project because two uh, two of the my good colleague actually working on that one, Inji and Matteo. Uh, so I understand that part, but you know, I really, you know, fascinated by the all the research you, you generate. I want to yes, quick question because uh thinking about the time we are in ahead. So I'm very interested in plastic upcycling, as you know, because I you know published some paper we are working on, you know, that's one of my main projects. Your project is very interesting. You are dealing with the polyethylene, uh, olefin, polyolefin, you know, plastic. And then you said you use pyro pyrolysis or catalytic, you know, conversion. Mm -hmm. And then that's amazing based on that data, you know, you 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 make the cell grow. I just wonder simply how much or what is the yield from that upstream chemical process? What percentage? I see. Yeah. You get in the, the conversion. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's that can whatever you know, put in yeah. whatever monomer you or small molecule you get in. How much? So I think this is something that's been very challenging for us to try to characterize because yeah. we have really poor solubility of that that hydrocarbon in our media. And so most of it is actually not even solubilized and accessible to the cell. And we've been having a lot of difficulty quantifying how much is actually available to the cell to begin to do this calculation of how much of that carbon gets converted into the silk. We can do a back of the envelope calculation. I have some students who should be doing that, but it, it's, it's very low. I'll tell you that. It's it very, very low. Um, and I think a lot of that problem is because most of what we're adding in to the media isn't even soluble. It is literally in some wow. precipitate chunk form and right. attempt to sort of calculate some sort of conversion of that, I think is not really representing, you know, what is happening metabolically, right? I see. How about the first step? So let's say you start with, uh, you know, one gram of polyethylene, how much you get hexa hexadecane or whatever? Oh, the depolymerization step. Yeah. So I don't yeah. know how much, um, how efficient that catalytic depolymerization is. I think I'd have to ask my argon collaborators. Okay. But once we receive it in this wax form, um, mm -hmm. we can do like, like let's let's do some quick math. I should know the answer to this, but so if we're growing like let's say a hundred liter, well, I think this came from a one liter culture. We generate something like eleven milligrams of silk, and mm -hmm. we have. What was our what was our weight percent that we used of so we're at point we're about I think we use somewhere around 0.5 percent um, of the the hexadecane mm -hmm. so if we do some quick math I mean you see the numbers become very bad right <laughs> but but you know um, I, I just curious because I mean like like two like two percent or something like that two percent <laughs> coming so, from the deep polymerization. So basically, what what I'm saying is, if we feed in mm -hmm. something like um, uh, like we'll put in, I think you know, like five grams or something like that into mm -hmm. like a one liter flask. We'll put in five grams of um, our, our depolarized plastic mm -hmm. and we'll get out like something like 11 milligrams of, of silk. So like if that's the order of magnitude that we're talking about. That's like, I that's see. really bad conversion. But um, my point is most of what we put in the flask is mm -hmm. not solubilized. It's like, we can retrieve it afterwards. It's still uh -huh. there, it's not accessible to the cells. So that conversion, if you were to calculate like how much do we put in versus how much silk we get, I think it's not a really good representation of what's happening metabolically. Yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm impressed by the the, the, the protein yield. Uh, and at the end of the day, you know, economically, e economic perspective, the poor depolymerization yield, not that much impactful for the TEA because essentially the plastic is cheap, I mean, waste is cheap. And then the yield is, I mean, the, but important, the silk proteins are expensive in some sense, high price. So, I mean, 
I, I do not worry about too much, but at the end of the commercialization, large scale, you know, still, you know, those kind of numbers are important, yeah. I guess. Yeah. So for me, I think what's important for us on, on this microbial side is we need to understand the, 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 the behavior of our cells mm -hmm. to a variety of different hydrocarbon compositions. Mm -hmm. So we could talk about molecular weight, we can talk about aromaticity or saturated versus unsaturated branch or not. We need to actually understand the specificity of our organisms to you know, these hydrocarbon feedstocks. And there's a lot of development, you know, in the, the pla on the plastic side, right? There's like, very, uh, there, people are always coming up with new ways of depolymerizing things or pyrolyzing things or other more novel, you know, methods of degrading a, a polyethylene or, poly or PET. I think for us, uh, on my end, I, I need us to understand how our system will react to the various output product streams from those, you know, those, those strategies. And yeah. if we have a good understanding of that, then we can say, all right, here, here's a new, you know, depolymerization strategy. It just got published. It's generating this composition of an output. And mm -hmm. we understand what that will do in our system. And so yeah. is that something we should look at for, uh, mm -hmm. you know, the feedstock for our system? Or is that something that I think in our system, it's not going to respond well to. And so we're not going to, you know, consider that. Sure, so sure. I'm pretty agnostic as to what, you know, um, what method is used to do that? It's, I call it a pre-digestion. It is pre-digesting a large bulky plastic down to like shorter chains for us. I'm pretty agnostic as to what method is used for that. Um, mm -hmm. What I care about is, is that gonna produce some sort of composition that is gonna, you know, our cells will behave well with. Okay, got it. Uh, I got one question from audience. So the question is on product toxicity, I am curious about how you are doing export and whether that makes a difference. How you are, we are doing? I think export means a secretion out. Uh, oh, 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 oh. Okay. So um, in the what I've shown here, the E. coli, the product is intracellular, so it's not okay. secreted. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's actually one of the biggest problems is why we have this product toxicity, because if you look at natural like cells in nature that produce silk, like the, the cells in silkworms that produce silk or the silk in spiders that produce the silk protein, they secrete it. They secrete their protein into this lumen, which is the storage space for the silk protein. They're not keeping it intracellular, whereas our E. coli are keeping the product intracellular. And that is most likely causing a lot of um, stresses on the cell. I mean, likely it's probably just like literally binding to cellular machinery or somehow other, you know, gunking up the works. Um, and so the E. coli we have are not secreting it, but we have actually recently um, published on um, engineered a bacillus megatherium system, which is able to secrete uh, mm -hmm. the silk protein. And what we actually found is very interesting that without the secretion tags on the protein, the bacteria is unable to make any silk at all, not even intracellular. So it's such a burden to have it within the cell that if it's not able to secrete it, it, it actually pretty much doesn't make any silk. Right. Um, and but once you have the secretion tag, it, it was able to do so. I think we got, you know, in this uh, sort of unoptimized it was at the end of Alex's PhD, but we got titers around 50 to 60 mg per liter, which is much higher than most of those E. coli strains that we saw. Got and it. I think with better optimization, that can be even higher. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's wonderful. I, I've seen some... Other group also done secretion for silk protein and that generally increased the, I think the titer or the production, I guess. Yeah. Uh, There's other challenges, right? You have to get this giant protein that's right. sort of repetitive and disordered out, out, out of the cell. But um, it seems like it, it makes sense to us that having it in the cell is a product, meta, it's, well, it's, it's, there's product related toxicity right, yes. to it. Yeah. But best get it out yeah. of the cell. Yeah, I mean, you and I have very, you know, interesting, you know, in uh, in a similar interest together. So, you know, I, I hope, I mean, we could, you know, collaborate sometime soon later on. So wonderful. I guess we need to end because now I see 11, 11. Uh, so that's, you know, close today. So thank you all for joining and staying today. We'll meet again on February 15, uh, to a uh, Thursday, the same time, the same June link, we'll have Professor James Carothers, 
interim chair of chemical engineering at U University of Washington. Uh, also, Dr. Sebastian uh, Castillo Hare, also the same university. As usual, the follow up informal chat will occur with our recording. Please stay here if you are interested in chatting with us. I will promote you to panelists. Uh, thanks. And I stop recording. Just give me one second.